So a very short introduction uh, to our next speaker. Uh, I'll start by saying much of our focus uh, at this conference has dwelt on globalization, inequality, and democracy in the rich countries, particularly in Canada. Most of our focus at this conference has dwelt on globalization, inequality, and democracy in the rich countries, including Canada. Is that better? However, these issues have, afflict, have afflicted developing countries even as extreme poverty has fallen in some of them. My pleasure and privilege now is to introduce our second keynote speaker, Julie Delahanty. I have had the privilege of knowing Julie for many years since, since she began her career in the 1990s at, wait for it, the North-South Institute. where she worked with Joanna Kerr and others on a gendered critique of structural adjustment. Imagine. She's worked since then in both the NGO community and in government, specifically the Department of Foreign Affairs, now known as GAC, which included postings abroad. So her perspectives on feminism and gender inequality uh, are, and what to do about these things are, are grounded in her experience as a practitioner as well as an analyst. She comes to us today after serving Oxfam Canada with brilliance and panache for the past five years. In fact, I just got a fundraising letter from Julie which started off, uh, I have the best job in the world and ended up saying, well, she's moving on. So that left me kind of sad and left a lot of other people sad, but I'm sure she's going on to some great things. So uh, one more thing I wanted to say before giving her the floor. Well, Julie will talk about her work and that of her colleagues at Oxfam Canada. I want to acknowledge the hugely important work uh, of Oxfam International, with which Oxfam Canada is affiliated, on the shocking degree of inequality at the global level and what to do about it, particularly through public expenditures and taxation, things that we've already heard something about in a developed country context. So please welcome Julie Delahanty. Thank you very much, everybody, and thank you, Roy, for that introduction. Uh, I want to begin by acknowledging that this meeting is taking place on the unceded, uh, unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. The traditional territory of the Algonquin Nation uh, runs the gamut of, uh, of the Ottawa Valley, including straddling the border between Ontario and Quebec. And uh, unlike in the rest of the prairies and much of Ontario and the prairies, uh, the Algonquin people were never part of a land sharing agreement. And therefore, this uh, land still holds Algonquin title. So I want to take a moment to thank the Algonquin people for allowing us to live, work, play, and meet on their land. I also want to thank the organizers of, the, uh, of, the, of this conference, and of course to your chair and my former boss, uh, Roy Culpepper, uh, for inviting me for this uh, important conference and for holding it annually. It's, uh, it's such a great event, and I haven't often been able to attend due to other commitments, but I'm really happy to be here this year. Uh, and I also want to thank all of the other incredible speakers from today who did such a great job. Uh, Catherine on care, Ellen on wage, uh, Leilani on human rights and housing, uh, the morning speakers on macro and microeconomics. Uh, so I feel like my contribution to this is a very uh, slim and much less intellectual contribution. Uh, but I thank you for, for being here and listening to it. Uh, so if we took a poll in the room right now, for those of you who don't know Oxfam, uh, some of you might think of us, or if, if you'd heard of us before, you would think about the work that we do on, um, on humanitarian assistance, humanitarian emergencies around the world, whether that's in Syria and Yemen, whether it's uh, the Rohingya refugee crisis, uh, whether it's Cyclone Ide, or any of the many other humanitarian crises around the world. 
Uh, we also work in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, where Oxfam is on the ground in more than 75 countries, supporting partners, especially women's rights organizations, to build their long-term development efforts. But we're perhaps most importantly a campaigning and advocacy organization. We are really dedicated to working with people around the globe uh, to shift power relations. So to move from inequality to equality, to move from injustice to justice, and doing all that linking global and local work. And that's why you might have seen some of our work on both gender and wealth inequality. And these are really at the heart of our campaigning work because uh, they're at the root in our, our view of poverty. Uh, I don't know, we, we had a show of hands yesterday or earlier today on who was at the climate march, but I was there and it was uh, an incredible moment. It was an incredible moment in Ottawa. It was incredible to see what was happening in, in uh, Montreal and it was incredible to see what happened around the world this whole, this whole week. Um, it, was, it was such an incredible show of democracy and of activism and really of emotion. And Greta Thunberg's speech before the UN this week was like a punch to the gut. Not because of the facts that she laid out, which are so dire that they're almost impossible to comprehend, but because of the raw emotion that she displayed, that mix of anger and fear. This is a perfectly sane reaction to the chaos that surrounds us. The result of growing up in a world where the powerful few hoard resources, power and wealth, while our planet is literally burning and millions of people are living in poverty. Like Greta, I think we need to bring our emotions and our outrage to our activism. If we're really concerned about the future of democracy and growing inequality, we need to be able to connect with people who are feeling angry and frightened, but are often unsure how to channel that action to get us back on a path towards social justice. Too many people are turning away from the promise of democracy towards populism and demagoguery precisely because they cannot see the path forward. Fear also makes people retrench into their own camps. Fear runs the risk of pitting feminist activists against climate activists, migrant communities against LGBTQ communities, and so on. Fear stops us from seeing how our struggles are interconnected and how we need to come together to think of bold solutions that break down all forms of inequalities. We know, and we've heard it today and yesterday, uh, that we now have levels of wealth that have never before been seen in human history, yet one in nine people go to sleep hungry every night. We live in an age of unparalleled consumerism, and it's destroying the planet for all of us. We should be very, very angry with these contradictions. It's more than 10 years since the financial crisis that shook the world and caused enormous suffering. In that time, the, future, the fortunes of the richest have risen dramatically. Since the financial crisis, the number of billionaires has nearly doubled. And those billionaires now have more wealth than ever before. Between 2017 and 2018, a new billionaire was created every two days. And wealth is becoming even more concentrated. The year before last, there were 43 people, and last year there were just 26 people who owned as much wealth as the bottom half of humanity. 3.8 billion people. The world's richest man, Jeff Bezos, owner of Amazon, saw his fortune increase to $112 billion. Just 1% of his fortune is the equivalent to the entire health budget of Ethiopia, 
a country of 105 million people. These huge levels of inequality are not an accident. They are not some regrettable but inevitable force of market discipline. It's all by choice, it's all deliberate, and it's all entirely optional. And it's simply morally wrong that millions of people suffer while a few wallow in wealth. That wealth that's being sucked up to the top at a really incredibly dizzying rate. The wealth of the world's billionaires increased by $900 billion in 2018 alone. So that's $2.5 billion a day going to about 2,700 people. So it is good news that globally the number of people living in extreme poverty has continued to fall. That is a testament to the enormous progress that has been made in recent decades. But the pace of poverty reduction has halved since 2013, and the number of people living in extreme poverty in sub-Saharan Africa is increasing. The wealth of the poorest half of humanity, that 3.8 billion people that I mentioned earlier, fell by 11% in 2018 alone. Billions of people live just above the poverty line, the extreme poverty line, and are just one crisis away from complete destitution. Take women making clothing in Myanmar, who Oxfam works with to fight for uh, better pay and conditions. They're at the bottom of the global supply chain of companies like Gap and H&M and Zara, clothes, clothes that many of us in this room are probably wearing. These women earn $4 a day, a little bit more if they hit their high pressure targets or work a lot of overtime. They work six days a week, sometimes seven, sometimes up to 23 hours a day. If they get sick, they don't get paid. If they get pregnant, they get fired. They have no rights and they have no voice. And they're treated like animals, and that's their quote, not mine. Yet by our definition, these women are no longer extremely poor. They live on more than the globally recognized poverty line of $1.90 a day. So we've stopped counting them. We've set the bar very low. We hide our heads in the sand, not to see these women and the millions of women like them. When we talk about wealth inequality, we cannot ignore gender inequality. Most of the world's richest are men. Globally, women earn 23% less than, than men. And of course, that gender pay gap has been increasing in interest. People are, are, are talking about that more. But less understood but equally alarming is the gender wealth gap, which along with earnings, including assets like land, like savings, like investments. And there's huge differences in the wealth gap, depending on where you live and for different groups of women. So for example, in Africa and in countries like India, Pakistan and Bangladesh, women account for only about 20 to 30% of the overall wealth. In the United States, unmarried white men own 100 times that of unmarried Hispanic women. The problem of extreme wealth isn't about the ability of the rich to buy yachts or to buy mansions or to have as many haircuts as they want. It's absolutely about the super rich being able to buy elections, to buy impunity from justice, to buy favorable laws, to buy longer lifespans. The rich have access to world-class health service while hundreds of thousands of women die in childbirth every year. Inequality literally reduces your lifespan. The United States Supreme Je Court Justice Louis Brandeis once said, you can have democracy or you can have wealth concentrated in the hands of a few. You cannot have both. So governments face a choice. 
and governments are making the wrong choice, inequality over democracy. Increasingly, governments are confidently repressive, cracking down on citizens. Civicus, an alliance dedicated uh, to strengthening citizens, tells us that serious threats to civic freedoms exist now in more than 100 countries. The capture of our politics by rich elites is causing a rise in populism. People are angry and have lost faith in mainstream politics. They're beginning to mobilize as well, like yesterday, for climate action. And our work at, at Oxfam has shown us the importance of climate change on some of the world's poorest people in the world. It is the poor who contribute the least to climate change who are the worst affected, who become yet more unequal <coughs> as climate change wreaks havoc in already very difficult conditions. And it is women and girls who suffer disproportionately in every single one of those situations. Listening to Greta's speech at the UN last week, should make us all ashamed. It is profoundly uncomfortable to listen to a child and to have to explain to them that the planet is burning and that we did nothing. Grown-ups haven't done anything to stop it even though we knew that it was gonna happen. How could we have let this happen? How will history judge us? And all of this is true, and I'm sure that all of you, like me, feel that we could have done more to raise our voices against climate change. But equally, this collective guilt is as inaccurate as it is distracting. Casting this as humanity's failure, or the failure of an entire generation, I think distorts as much as it clarifies. As if an elderly woman here in Canada, living in poverty on old age security, has the same responsibility for climate breakdown as an octogenarian billionaire. The fact is, the rich and the powerful are far more responsible, responsible for our planet burning than our ordinary citizens. Oxfam first drew attention to the link between extreme wealth and climate change ahead of the Paris COP, where we calculated that the carbon footprint of one of the global 1% could be up to 175 times larger than the poorest 10%. Basically, the more money you have, the bigger your consumption, the greater your carbon footprint. Elon Musk's private plane took 250 flights last year. In Kenya, where I was last week, the richest dropped their children off at school in helicopters. But the additional responsibility of the richest for climate change is about more than their personal carbon emissions. It's more importantly about their investments that are bankrolling a fossil fuel future. They can be directly investing in fossil fuel or indirectly by investing with and in banks, in hedge funds, in insurance companies, all of which are themselves invested heavily in fossil fuel extraction. And the wealthy are also funding lobbyists and political parties that are seeking to block the transition away from fossil fuels. There is big money behind this economic model, and that big money generally belongs to the world's richest. What seems very clear is that extreme wealth and a sustainable planet are not compatible. But here, I've talked about a lot of emotions. I feel very emotional, but I want to talk about another emotion, which is hope. I was so inspired by the climate protests yesterday and this week. I'm inspired by the youth movement. I'm inspired by Greta Thunberg. She's an oracle. <laughs> this is what one girl can do. I'm inspired by the many women around the world who I've talked to who are taking control of their lives. Women who are married as children, who are now fighting against early marriage in their communities. Refugees who've come through incredible odds and are now leaders. I'm inspired by the rising up of the women's movement. From the Women's March after the Trump inauguration, the explosion of the women's movement in India in the past five years, 
the Me Too movement, the strong feminists behind Black Lives Matter and I Don't Know More, and the rebuilding of the women's movement here in Canada. And along with all that fear, outrage, anger, hope, what we really need, of course, is some action. And the scale and complexity of the inequality crisis we're in requires a complex and global response. Oxfam is a complex and global organization, and we understand how issues like tax policy and climate resilience and women's unpaid care work are all interconnected. That's why we are putting forward systemic solutions to the global inequality crisis. First, we need to tackle extreme wealth in conjunction with the tackling extreme poverty. There's an urgent need to make the tax system work harder to tackle inequality, to stop the race to the bottom on taxation that allows the super rich to hoard wealth and that fuels an ever-growing and dangerous divide between the rich and the rest. Taxes are the most important tool that governments have to match much-needed public services and to address inequality. But unfair tax rules and active tax dodging by corporations and wealthy individuals rob public budgets of hundreds of billions of dollars. The potential benefit of redistributing the wealth of the very richest by even a tiny amount tells a very compelling story. A levy of just 1.5% on the wealth of the world's billionaires that's just the billionaires, that 2,700 people I mentioned earlier, could get every single child into school and deliver health care in all of the world's poorest countries. Second, free public services like health and education can help to reduce inequality. These services are known as the great equalizers or a virtual income because they can mitigate the worst impacts of inequality. We need to stand up for public services, health care, education, child care, elder care, and other social protections. This is the most effective action we can take to stop the inequality train wreck. Third, we know that it's income from work that determines most people's economic status. The reality for many of the world's poorest is that no matter how hard they work, they can never escape poverty. A South African platinum worker or platinum miner would need to work for 93 years just to earn the average mining company CEO's annual bonus. So tackling inequality begins with living wages, safe and fair working conditions, and the rights of workers to organize. And it also means curbing excessive corporate pay. And we need to prioritize gender equality. We know that societies in which the gap between the rich and the poor is much lower are those where women are treated more equally. While fighting to support care work and fair work, we have to generally fight for more equal society. Ensuring equal rights to inheritance and asset ownership, decent jobs for women, and greater representation of women in leadership positions. To build an economy that works for women, we need a comprehensive approach that particularly tackles the structural and often hidden barriers to women's equality. If women cannot choose if and when they have children, they will not be able to take advantage of skills and education. If women face violence in the home, at work, or on the streets, they can't be productive. If women are bogged down in doing all the unpaid care work, they don't have time to pursue appropriate paid work. It will require leadership to tackle the social norms that keep women at the bottom of the economy, to recognize, reduce, and redistribute unpaid care work, to close the gender wage and wealth gap, and to enforce decent working conditions. Couple those with a solid investment in women's rights organizations who play a critical role in catalyzing change toward gender equality, and we will see results. And finally, we need to protect civil society space. A healthy, vibrant civil society with strong social movements and active citizens 
is essential to ensuring that politicians and institutions are working in the interests of many. We need to become better and more explicit about speaking to the intersection, the intersectional dimensions of inequality. We can't speak out against a broken economic system and failing democracies without speaking out against racism, hate, xenophobia, anti-LGBTQ, colonialism, and so on. We need not only more diversity, and ask yourselves whether we consider this room to be diverse enough, but we need greater inclusion. And that means changing the way that we work and live. Governments need to listen, and we need to raise our voices more loudly. Democracy requires an open and informed debate. That's why we've been pushing party leaders to take a stand and actually debate issues that matter. Women's, women's rights, economic equality, climate change, social justice. If our leaders are not pressed to say what they will do to address inequality, then they won't. That's why we're also working with women's rights activists from across the country to call for a leaders' debate on women's rights and gender equality between now and October 21st. I think the last one Mr. Broadwin was in, which was in 1984. It's been a long time since we've had that debate. We are many fighting for this future. If we destroy the toxic idea that extreme inequality is inevitable, that extreme wealth is necessary, then we'll be able to start building a truly human economy and a world that values and respects the dignity and rights of every one of us. And I think you'll all agree that that is worth fighting for. Thank you very much.